Hello and welcome to eBible Fellowship's Evening Bible Studies with your host and Bible teacher, Chris McCann. We invite you to our website at ebiblefellowship.org for additional Bible studies. And now with his study in the Book of Romans, here's Chris McCann. Good evening and welcome to eBible Fellowship's Bible study in the book of Romans. Tonight is study number 30 of Romans chapter 1. We're going to be reading verse 16. For I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God unto salvation to everyone that believeth, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. Now this is a statement that the Apostle Paul, who is the pattern of believers, is making uh, concerning the gospel of Christ. And we know the gospel is uh, really the Bible. It, it's the word of God. And he is saying he's not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, the doctrine of Christ, of the scripture. And that means he's not ashamed of, of the things that the Bible teaches, the the doctrines, the various instruction that the Lord gives his people on the pages of the Bible, such as we're to get married and stay married to one person and not marry someone who's married to someone else and been divorced in the eyes of the world, but not in the eyes of God. Or that Sunday is God's holy day, or that there's not to be sexual relations, fornication, outside of the established marriage institution. And on and on and on, the Bible instructs the elect children of God regarding how we are to live uh, in, in just about every situation with every person, to love our neighbor, to be kind to the unthankful and to the evil and love our enemies and so forth. God's word tells us this is what my people are to do. What those created in my image are to do in thought, in word, and in deed. These are the things that I command, that I declare ought to be done. And these are the commandments of the Lord. And Paul, as well as all of the people of God, are not ashamed of the gospel of Christ. You know what's what's, um, amazing? It it, it really is. It it is um, incredible. It's a stunning thing that this would even need to be said. That this would have to be spoken, that that it would have to be uh, written in God's word to let us know, to, to make us aware that we're not to be ashamed of the gospel of Christ. Now, now why do I say that? Well, you know, we're very much aware that people of the world look down upon the gospel of Christ They look down upon the Bible and those who would read it and and even uh, more so believe it and seek to keep it and to do it over the history of the world. They have been the lowest of the low. They are the people who are to be pitied by the people of the world. And in a sense, shame has been heaped upon them. Because they identify with Christ, they identify with the Word of God, the Bible. And that's what's shocking, stunning, amazing. That when we consider the people of the world who would cast this shame upon those who truly identify with with the Bible, and we see what the Bible tells us about them or what the Bible tells us about shame itself. And that's, I think, the first thing we need to start with. 
let's talk about what the Bible has to say regarding being ashamed of the reason why, what it is, as much as we can understand it. We, we know typically in the world today, uh, we still hear this kind of language where someone will say, you should be ashamed. Or a person feeling ashamed says, uh, I'm ashamed of what I did, of what I said. I, I'm, I'm ashamed. It, it, it's a horrible feeling. And what does it mean? Well, it, or what do they mean? They mean they've done something wrong, something bad, maybe worse than bad, something totally unacceptable, even by worldly standards, something that's degrading or disgraceful or dishonoring, embarrassing. They're, they're embarrassed because they've done this or said this. And, and you know, the, if truth be told, one of the reasons why they're ashamed is because the thing has become known. It's become public. And it's now seen by the eyes of their fellow man. And that's what's shameful to them. They may have been doing this thing for a long time, secretly, you know, uh, without anyone knowing. And they felt uneasy about it, but but continued on with their life. They didn't feel that horrible, disgusting feeling of shame until it was discovered. And, of course, this would get into the area of the world not seeing God as the elect people of God see God and know that God, more importantly, sees them as all things are naked and open unto the eyes of him with whom we have to do, we're told in the book of Hebrews. But uh, anyway, as far as feeling ashamed, the world has a very good sense of what it is. They know what it is. And we all know what it is to be ashamed of something you've said or done, your actions, your words. And this really goes back all the way to the Garden of Eden. If we turn back to Genesis chapter 2, in Genesis 2, we read in the last verse, after God has created everything and everything is wonderful, all is good, there's no sin in the world, it says in Genesis 2.25, And they were both naked, the man and his wife, and were not ashamed. Of course not. Of course they were not ashamed. They had nothing to be ashamed of. Because all was good. You know, no one's ashamed of doing good. Or are they? Or are they? That, that's something we'll have to talk about maybe a little later. But typically in the world... If the world, well, even that's getting perverted and so corrupt, maybe you can't make that statement that no one's, no one's ashamed of doing good today. That's not even true out in the world. But let's say, historically, over the course of the world, for the most part, people are not ashamed for doing good. But, but they're ashamed when they do evil, when they've done wrong, when they've sinned. Now, as far as God's concern and truth is concerned and the Bible's concerned, there was no shame in the world while mankind obeyed God and kept his commandments. They were naked, Adam and Eve, without shame. What's to be ashamed? There was no lust. There was no perversion of sexual desires. Everything was good. Every look Adam gave to his wife every thought that he had towards her and and her in response to him was pure it was holy it was perfect and good but we find in the next chapter once sin entered into the world once adam and eve have disobeyed god that we read in in genesis 3 verse 6 and when the woman saw that the tree was good for food, and that it was pleasant to the eyes, 
and a tree to be desired to make one wise, she took of the fruit thereof and did eat, and gave also unto her husband with her, and he did eat. And the eyes of them both were open, and they knew that they were naked. And they sewed fig leaves together, and made themselves aprons. And they heard the voice of Jehovah God walking in the garden in the cool of the day. And Adam and his wife hid themselves from the presence of Jehovah God amongst the trees of the garden. And Jehovah God called unto Adam, and said unto him, Where art thou? And he said, I heard thy voice in the garden, and I was afraid, because I was naked, and I hid myself. And he said, Who told thee that thou wast naked? Hast thou eaten of the tree whereof I commanded thee that thou shouldest not eat? You see, now sin has come. And and the first thing, the very first thing that Adam and Eve seem to realize is their nakedness. And, And they quickly work, sew fig leaves together to cover themselves. And notice also, when they hear God, they don't go running towards him. But instead, when they heard the voice of Jehovah walking in the cool of the day, Adam and his wife hid themselves from the presence of Jehovah God amongst the trees of the garden. And natural guilt and shame, their nakedness, They tried to cover it as best they could with fig leaves, but they still feel naked even with the covering over their private parts. And and really, you see, from this point forward, physical nakedness will become a picture of spiritual nakedness, of having one's sins open, exposed to the eyes of God. And... And also, from this point forward, mankind will run away from God. He'll go from the presence of Jehovah. That's why Jonah got on board the ship going to Tarshish to go with them from the presence of Jehovah. And because it was a picture of the Lord Jesus entering into the human race as all mankind have been going away from the presence of Jehovah down through the centuries. And, and, and what we're seeing today is, is the, the end scene. It, it's the finality of man's running away, his going as far from God as he possibly can to escape the gaze, the eyes of the all-seeing and all-knowing God. But you see, it all relates around sin. Sin. Now, even though the word shame isn't used here in Genesis 3, it it has everything to do with it. Let's go to Revelation chapter 3. Revelation 3, where the Lord is addressing the church in Laodicea. And it says here in verse 17, I'll start there, Because thou sayest, I am rich and increased with goods and of need of nothing and knowest not that thou art wretched and miserable and poor and blind and naked. I counsel thee to buy of me gold tried in the fire that thou mayest be rich and white raiment that thou mayest be clothed and that the shame of thy nakedness do not appear and anoint thine eyes with eye salve that thou mayest see the shame of thy nakedness. The first thing Adam and Eve realized, we're naked. We're naked. We have to cover ourselves. And and then and here comes God, the voice of Jehovah. And they had to run. They, they had to hide themselves, flee from the presence of Jehovah. And, and, and it, it's because of shame. It's because of shame nakedness and shame go hand in hand in the Bible. Uh, You can read Isaiah 20. In Isaiah chapter 20, which is a very short chapter, it says in verse 4, So shall the king of Assyria lead away the Egyptians prisoners and the Ethiopians captives. 
young and old, naked and barefoot, even with their buttocks uncovered to the shame of Egypt. And they shall be afraid and ashamed of Ethiopia, their expectation, and of Egypt, their glory. The, the shame, their nakedness is to their shame. And, and by the way, that's one of the things God is actively doing now in the day of judgment by exposing the sins. You know, we, we hear about the Me Too movement and it seems like every other day, if not every day, there's someone who said this a long time ago or, or has his photo taken or her photo taken doing the other thing. And it's coming to public scrutiny. It, it, it comes to uh, the attention of the world. It, it's put everywhere to their shame. No, they're not physically naked, although sometimes it, it may be photos of physical nakedness. But for the most part, it's not that. It is a dirty, rotten deed or something they've said. You see that that has been exposed that now the world it, it labels a certain way and and, and it's like nakedness. It, it's the exposure of one sinful condition and and that is one of the characteristics of judgment day where every idle word is will come into judgment is what the Bible says. And, and so uh, we shouldn't be surprised that this is happening so often. And no, not every human being will experience this. But you see, as um, the renowned, the famous, the, the ones who are the rich and powerful, they are representatives of the world. And, and so it's as though God is shaming the world. He's shaming Babylon and and exposing the sin of Babylon to all and that is the very picture we see in the book of Isaiah in Isaiah 47 where it says in verse 1 come down and sit in the dust O virgin daughter of Babylon sit on the ground there is no throne O daughter of the Chaldeans for thou shalt no more be called tender and delicate Take the millstones and grind meal. Uncover thy locks. Make bare the leg. Uncover the thigh. Pass over the rivers. Thy nakedness shall be uncovered. Yea, thy shame shall be seen. I will take vengeance and will not meet thee as a man. This is language of God's judgment upon Babylon. Babylon's nakedness will be uncovered. Babylon's sin shall be seen. And Babylon is a figure that represents the world as a whole, the kingdom of Satan. And and so that's exactly what we're seeing. It's exactly what we're seeing because we're living in the time of the exposure of the sins of the world. Remember when God's judgment was on the corporate church, when he was judging the house of God for 23 years. The sins of the church kept coming to the surface. This pastor, that priest, it still may happen now because they're still, as it were, a province of Babylon as they were annexed and and taken over by Satan. But during that intense 23-year Great Tribulation period, it it was constant. And, And the world was laughing and mocking. Here is another story. The news media would report on concerning some shameful thing done by a pastor, an elder, or or this church, or, uh, you know, stealing money, or, or uh, here's, here's a pastor flying around in jets, and, and whatever, just these shameful things, and the world would report and, and rejoice and mock because the judgment of God was upon them. And Satan and his kingdom, the king of Babylon and Babylonians, were the instrument of God's judgment. But now it's turned. Now it's turned. Now Babylon is the object of the wrath of God. The news media that reported on the shameful activities 
of the church over the course of the Great Tribulation, now itself is being reported on and publicly humiliated because the news media is like the mouthpiece of the world. And and, and so we're seeing something remarkable. We're, we're seeing God take vengeance for his temple. And we're witnessing it every day. But as we, again, think of shame, the Bible links it to sin. It, it links it in Genesis 2 and chapter 3. And it tells us that in Revelation 3.18, be clothed and to be clothed would be through uh, salvation. A sinner could be spiritually clothed with the righteousness of Christ. And that would cover, that's the fine white linen the Bible speaks of, cover their nakedness and it, it's, a, it's a pure gown. Now, no more sin. Therefore, no more shame. No more need to be ashamed of course after we become saved in this world we might still sin in the body but we remind ourselves and and we when we pray and we confess and admit oh lord i did this this horrible thing this shameful thing i thought this i did this i said this whatever it is and then we're reminded by the word of god that there is therefore now no more condemnation to those in Christ Jesus, that either at this point, as we have completed the day of salvation, that all who have become saved are saved, the righteous will be righteous still, and the filthy, filthy still. Either all of our sins, 100% of them, the totality of them, from um, when we were in our mother's womb, into the future, to the day we die, or until the day Christ comes, every sin we've ever committed has been paid for. It's either that or no sin that we've committed has been paid for. And that ugly mountain, that that cesspool of iniquity that we have done, that we're guilty of, is upon us. And, and don't think it's just that last sin, the one you're feeling bad about now. Oh, no. If it's not limited to that, it's, it's either all of them are still upon you or none of them are upon you. And we realize that and we say, oh, yes. Oh, yes. Thank God for his mercy. Thank God for his grace and that he has paid for all my sin. And by that grace, I, I have this clean, fine, white linen, the righteousness of saints. And it is the, by the obedience of one, the Lord Jesus Christ, that I have been made righteous. It's none of me, none of my righteousness, which are all filthy rags, but it's his righteousness. And then being reminded, we're also encouraged that he loved us. Therefore, we are to love him and we Display that love by keeping his commandments. O Lord, strengthen me. Grant me strength and power to turn from this sin and and not to do it again in that way. O please, help me, O Lord, to live to your glory. Well, you see, this is what the Bible would teach us about shame. And we read in Psalm 25... And these are very helpful verses. Psalm 25, beginning in verse 1 through verse 3. Unto thee, O Jehovah, do I lift up my soul. O my God, I trust in thee. Let me not be ashamed. Let not mine enemies triumph over me. Yea, let none that wait on thee be ashamed. Let them be ashamed which transgress without cause. And here we find that God is speaking directly to his people. Well, first there's the petition, let me not be ashamed. 
And then in verse 3, Yea, let none that wait on thee be ashamed. Let them be ashamed which transgress without cause. And what is it to transgress? It is the sin. Let me not be ashamed because I wait on God. Let me not be ashamed if I live as a Christian. Isn't that what it says in First Peter? In First Peter chapter 4, I'll start reading in verse 14. If ye be reproached for the name of Christ, happy are ye. For the spirit of glory and of God resteth upon you. On their part, he is evil spoken of. But in your part, he is glorified. But let none of you suffer as a murderer or as a thief or as an evil doer or as a busybody in other men's matters. That is, don't suffer as a sinner. Yet, if any man suffer as a Christian, let him not be ashamed, but let him glorify God on this behalf. Let him not be ashamed if he suffers as a Christian. And to be a Christian is to, of course, be adopted into the family of God, into the family of Christ. It is to identify completely with the Word of God, the Bible. It is to, to trust the Word, believe the Word, follow the Word, love the Word, proclaim the Word, and and we we do it with our families, we do it with our neighbors, we do it with friends, we do it with strangers, and we do it in front of enemies before all. The Lord Jesus said in Mark chapter 8, in the last verse of that chapter, verse 38, Whosoever therefore shall be ashamed of me and of my words in this adulterous and sinful generation, of him also shall the Son of Man be ashamed when he cometh in the glory of his Father with the holy angels. And, and you see, it does come down to this. Whosoever will be ashamed of me and of my words. If we're ashamed to, to carry the Bible, if we're ashamed to let people know that we believe this particular truth, that the Bible teaches the word of Christ, we're ashamed of Christ. There, there's no getting around it. He and his word are uh, inseparable. They're one and the same. And, and, and so let us not be ashamed. Now, um, we're going to come back to this because this is an important topic. It's an important thing for us to look at. And it, it's, it's so bizarre, so bizarre that... People can be ashamed of Christ, who is good and perfect, and not ashamed of sin. Uh, well, we don't have time now. We'll, we'll look at this again in our next Bible study. You've been listening to eBible Fellowship's Evening Bible Studies with your host and Bible teacher, Chris McCann. Visit our website at ebiblefellowship.org for additional studies. Until next time, may the Lord's perfect will be done.